Welcome to episode 193 of the G2 on 5G. It's the latest insight scoop on everything 5G. We cover six topics in about 20 minutes, and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend, and joining me again this week is fellow analyst Anshul Sag. Um, we're both traveling this week. We're recording on a Sunday night. Uh, Anshul is at Microsoft Build, and I'm at Dell Tech World. I just uh, landed in Vegas a few hours ago. But uh, you're going to be joining me soon, right? And we're going to try to record another episode here at Dell Tech World. Yeah, we'll see if that works out. Uh, I realized that I didn't bring my tripod, so we'll have to figure out a way to uh, prop up my camera and get a good angle. But if it doesn't work out, we can always, you know, go back to our default at-home setups. Yep, we might have to do that. But hey, let's get started with my first topic. I want to talk about AT&T and AST Space Mobile. So uh, last week on May 15, um, both companies signed a definitive commercial agreement. And this takes uh, what was formerly a memo of understanding and makes it uh, formal. And uh, from my perspective, this could greatly accelerate what the companies do together to integrate uh, AST's upcoming launch this summer. Um, they'll be launching uh, five or six uh, production satellites into AT&T's network to provide gap coverage. Um, some additional news, Chris Sambar, that's head of networks, who uh, both you and I know very well, uh, will be accepting a position on AST Space Mobile's uh, board of directors. And I think that's a great move. Chris brings a lot of experience. Both companies have been working together since 2018. Again, this just formalizes their collaboration. And um, I was expecting this, you know, just given how close AST Space Mobile is to um, launching their first set of production satellites. But What's your take on all this? I think it's a natural evolution of their partnership together. Um, I think that when you look at how long they've been working together and kind of just the state of the relationship, it seems like AT&T is really fully committed to AST Space Mobile now. Uh, and getting a seat on the board uh, is both a vote of confidence, but also um, a little bit of a, um, you know, AT&T wanting to control their own destiny. Um, and being able to maybe steer some of the decision making happening at AST Space Mobile, um, but yeah, they've you know they've raised money, and now they're deepening their partnership with AT and T, and it seems like you know we've got different satellite startups now really fully aligning themselves with different carriers in the U.S. Uh, certainly, and they're they're kind of niching themselves out as well. We've talked about uh, Satelliet; they're in Barcelona. They're focused on IoT. And, uh, you know, I've had a chance to speak with Abel, the CEO, and uh, it's exciting. It's a heavy lift, what AST is doing. And, um, you know, it just takes time. And I think there have been a lot of critics uh, of AST Space Mobile, given they've had to push things out somewhat. But um, it's a monumental undertaking, uh, for sure, especially for a company that is still in startup mode. But Abel brings a lot of experience. He's a very successful entrepreneur. And um, yeah, I think it's it's exciting, and the yet is uh, the best is yet to come from from my perspective there. But let's move to your first topic, and you want to talk about what do you want to talk about? Well, we talked about Dish last week, and um, there's a DoD deal that potentially might be able to to save the company from bankruptcy. Yeah, so I think that's a a, a, a very uh, optimistic view. Yeah. Um, I think what it is is they signed a deal with the Department of Defense um, and they made it very clear so everybody knew this deal went through. So clearly it's an important deal to them. Um, they basically said that they have a 10 year long deal um, and Hughes Networks Systems and Boost Mobile will provide 5G wireless services and devices to support DOD usage in all 50 states and US territories. Um, and this will be done uh, for the U.S. Navy under the Spiral Four program, um, and will be available to buyer, be buyers will be available to buyers in the Defense Department, and other federal agencies. So, mm -hmm. we're we the U.S. taxpayer are paying two point seven billion dollars over ten years for this. So that's two hundred and seventy million dollars a year mm -hmm. that um, they will be taking in as revenue. Yeah. Um, while this is not a uh, significant number for, I would say, any other carrier. I think when you look at the state of Dish and Echo Star, mm -hmm. um, it's not great, but it's 
it's it's much better than what they're at right now and they desperately need to get wins and whether you agree or not this is a win um i do think it's interesting now that they are using echo star as the um the final entity yeah um i maybe the dish name doesn't carry the same uh, strength it used to it's unfortunate because dish was a very strong brand mm -hmm. um, but i would say that they've also eroded that brand quite a bit um, and i think my hopes are i would say cautiously optimistic um, but considering everything else that's going on um, you know i i don't really know what to think but what i will say is every time people have counted charlie ergen out um, they've been wrong so yeah you know the guy knows how to survive and um, there's a chance that this this might be the turning point for them. I, I don't know, but I, I do think this is a significant deal for them. Yeah, Charlie does seem to be the energizer bunny <laughs> from my perspective. But I did I did not catch this news. But I'm wondering, is this a scenario where you know Dish needs to be successful so that um, there's no concern around anti competitiveness? Because you know one of the big deals in getting the T-Mobile um, acquisition of Sprint approved was this divestiture of Spectrum and, and basically helping uh, DISH launch, you know, its its mobile network. So it from your perspective, is this a scenario where, you know, the government is going to earmark, you know, these funds just to ensure that there's a competitive fourth carrier in the U.S.? I mean, certainly U.S. Cellular has proven not to be, right? And we, we talked about them last week and the potential cut up that that might occur if, if T-Mobile and, and Verizon got involved with uh, with splitting up their subscribers. But w what's your take on that? I don't know. I, I can't say definitively. Yeah. Um, I, I think there might be some of that in this sense that they're trying to, you know, prop up a, a, a fourth player. Um, yeah. But it might also be that their bid was just way lower. Yeah. Huh. Good point. Well, it'll be interesting to kind of follow the news as it kind of winds out. Let's go to my second topic, and the PGA uh, of Americas is leaning into T-Mobile uh, for private 5G networking for the big tournament that occurred this weekend, and, um, and and Scotty did not win. I mean, I don't know if, did you catch the news about Scotty and his accident? It was crazy, right? Yeah. The PGA Tour, yeah, or um, Valhalla, you know, I'm not a huge golfer, but but what's this really is, cool, yeah. This was a PGA ahead. championship at That's Valhalla. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, what's really cool about what T-Mobile did to support the event. So um, they deployed a private 5G network and uh, they use that network for a couple of scenarios. One from a broadcasting perspective and T-Mobile claims it's the first, you know, 5G integrated, um, you know, uh, connectivity to support broadcasting. And, you know, I've been to golf tournaments, I've been to PGA tournaments and there's just, you know, miles and miles and miles of cable. That is just strung all over the place. And so uh, this eliminated that. It allowed, um, uh, you know, the tournament to be able to use 5G to, for broadcast perspective. Uh, it also allowed for some fan activations as well. But what I found really intriguing was a, a network slice that was dedicated for critical business operations for the, the tournament, which included ticketing as well as point of sale. So, I mean, what a great showcase for the power of 5G on, on multiple fronts. So um, what do you think? I caught this news. Um, yeah. I think T-Mobile did a good job of communicating it outward. Um, I do think they could have done a better job of inviting people out to check it out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm mostly goofing around, but um, <laughs> I do think it was interesting that they um, they did have some enhanced experiences um, like 5G connected cameras at Hole 13 um, mm -hmm. for CBS Sports. Um, and I believe that this was part of T-Mobile's advanced network solutions. Um, yes. And I believe that this is a long-standing partnership between the PGA and T-Mobile. So this is going to be something that I think we're going to see a lot of throughout mm -hmm. all of the majors um, at the, that, that the PGA has. Uh, I believe the, the, the uh, PGA has four majors. Um, and they've already gone through the the Masters and the PGA Championship, so I think there's two left. Um, and those will be, I think, a pretty big deal for T-Mobile to continue to support the PGA um, because, you know, I, I think there's a lot of appetite for flexibility 
Um, and I think there's a lot of appetite for more bandwidth. And um, in order to be flexible and to provide more bandwidth, you kind of need 5G. Yeah, no, I agree. It's interesting. Uh, T-Mobile is really uh, beginning to focus on, you know, sporting events and, and venues uh, with its 5G uh, network. Um, we've talked about, you know, Major League Baseball and, you know, now PGA. This is something traditionally that that Verizon was very heavily focused on and AT&T to a lesser extent. But, but AT&T has, you know, sponsored things like the Final Four. They've um, deployed uh, the network at uh, the Dallas Cowboy venue as well in Dallas. So, but the T-Mobile is beginning to build, you know, from my perspective, a real beachhead with respect to uh, to venue deployment. So, and I just think this was just a great use case. It really demonstrated a number of different elements that come together within, you know, a sporting event and the power of 5G and then network slicing on top of that. So I thought it was pretty cool. But hey, let's go to your second topic. And you want to talk about uh, Germany and uh, the fact that they're close to banning Chinese equipment from, um, from their um, public networks. Yes. So... Um... In Germany, there has long been a dispute whether or not Huawei equipment is a security risk. And it seems that the interior foreign and econ economic ministries are behind a proposal to rip and replace um, Huawei 5G equipment. However, the digital ministry is resisting. Um, and it sounds like they're probably going to lose this battle um, because the uh, talk on the street is that by 2026, there will need to be um, a, a rip and replace program for Huawei and ZTE equipment. And I, if I recall correctly, certain carriers in Germany, like Deutsche Telekom, have quite a bit of Huawei equipment. Um, so it would be a considerable lift and a relatively expensive one. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that mm -hmm. there there is appetite for this. and. Uh, my understanding is that uh, this is more of an alignment for the rest of the Western world. Um, and truthfully, um, while we haven't really had clear indications of what risks there are with Huawei equipment, um, mm -hmm. it does seem like there is a, uh, uh, a uniform agreement that there is a risk among intelligence agencies uh, across the world. And at this point, it's really a question of, I think, when, not if. Yeah. I agree. You know, there are a few countries that are sort of holdouts in, in Europe and the Middle East and, and that sort of thing. But it does seem like most of the rest of the world is following behind the U.S.'s lead with respect to concerns around Chinese infrastructure. And that's both, to your point, CTE and Huawei. And unfortunately, it's one of these scenarios where, you know, based on national security, there aren't a lot of details that are provided. And so it's difficult for either one of those companies to defend themselves. But um, but there, there certainly is a, um, you know, a consistency with respect to uh, other parts of the world following the U.S.'s lead here. So, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I think, you know, the, the, the final stragglers will probably come into alignment, you know, at some point. And. I mean, you know, Huawei is an example. I mean, they've been, you know, very quickly diversifying their focus. And we've talked about that on prior podcasts. They're they're focusing on their enterprise networking business. They they continue to provide infrastructure, obviously, to the hometown heroes like China Mobile. And actually, that's a great segue for my third topic. I want to talk about China Mobile. And they're investing a ton of resources and AI compute infrastructure. But what's in this was an article that I caught in light reading. And so let me share the, the details. So at a very high level, um, the uh, China Mobile has uh, ordered up to 265,000 servers. Some of this infrastructure is being provided by ZTE, but there, there are also two other companies, H3C and Xfusion. Um, and then specifically, 2 billion US dollars is focused on discreetly on 8,000 AI servers. But what I find really interesting, and you know, and the article goes on to sort of talk about the capacity and that sort of thing that will be at uh, China Mobile's disposal. But as you read through the article, it's pretty light on what they're going to do with all of this, right? So 
from from my perspective, when you look at AI and you know what it can do and and you know telecom networks, it can it can do a lot around um, self healing. Um, it can generative AI can support um, functions like uh, customer service and and that sort of thing. But again, here's another announcement with really really big numbers from China, and there's not a lot of substance behind it. So I I don't know if you caught this or you you have any comment, but it's sort of a theme, right? We we've talked about you know a lot of you know the chess beating by by the Chinese government, but there typically doesn't seem to be a lot of substance behind what they do. Yeah, unfortunately, when it comes to anything China mobile related, um, there's not much detail. You know, yeah. we talked about their five G advanced stuff, very light on detail. They, yeah. China mobile doesn't even release like press releases. They use you know, Chinese state media to to talk about things. So um, in general, I like to treat anything that that comes out of um, our friends at uh, China Mobile with a, you know, very uh, large grain of salt, um, <laughs> just because, you know, it's very hard to validate a lot of their claims. Yeah. And there's not a lot of transparency. And yeah, it just doesn't really feel like a very... Um, clear understanding of what's going on so um yeah you know i think huawei is just one of those companies that um they're going to continue to supply developing nations um and countries that are close to china politically um yeah. but i think that if you're not aligned with china uh, you're probably not going to be carrying huawei equipment for very long yeah i agree well, hey, buddy, let's hit your third and final, and you're at Build, Microsoft Build, and you want us to talk about um, their their push with AIPC and hybrid AI and how that might finally move the needle on 5G PCs. Yes, yeah, so tomorrow there's going to be a lot of announcements. Um, I think it's been already made apparently clear that there will be, you know, a lot of 5G-related um, announcements. I, if anything, really, I would say it's more AI. Um, yeah. But the thing that a lot of people are missing um, is that a lot of these AI use cases are going to be uh, a combination of on-device and cloud. Um, mm -hmm. And not everything's going to be able to be on-device right away. Yeah. And while I think that there will be a really big push with Qualcomm's you know, 645 TOPS MPU, um, and, and 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 enabling experiences that are on device, there are still going to be a lot of experiences that want to, you know, basically be a hybrid AI experience that takes advantage of what your device can do, but also what the cloud can enhance that with. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be a hybrid AI experience. And I think we're going to see a lot more talk about hybrid AI and how 5G is the perfect example of, you know, always having a connection because, you know, I feel like cloud computing alone should already justify 5G connection. Yeah. Uh, but if you add AI to the equation, it's like, okay, so I can't always connect to, you know, the most powerful GPUs in the cloud because I don't have a 5G connection. I can do something locally, but really I think, you know, the, the real power is having a 5G connected PC that uh, allows you to connect both to the cloud and to the AI uh, I guess, you know, the cloud is powered by AI nowadays, but um, yeah. I, I just think that we're, 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 we're moving towards a place where, you know, I think we're going to see more use of 5G uh, because of AI. Um, yeah. And what's funny is I was just on a Verizon webinar uh, about 5G connected PCs. I think that was on Friday. And um, they were talking about AI and hybrid AI and how, that is an opportunity for for growth in 5G PCs, um, and I and I really do believe that. And I actually, you know, I've been saying that for a while now. And I think a lot of my theories around AI and the PC are going to be validated over the next few months as as this thing starts to really pick up speed. Because you know, wow. Intel's been talking about it for a while, and so is AMD. But now Qualcomm gets to you know release their 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 thing and. I think we're going to see a lot of back and forth and a lot of acceleration in terms of capabilities. But, you know, reality, in reality, I don't think we're going to have as many 5G PCs as I would have liked. Um, and I think that's going to be maybe something that uh, we see grow down the road. Well, I think what, what really has to happen, one of the biggest challenges has been just the, the activation experience. 
And, you know, when you, and I, and I know this because many years ago when I was a doll, I, I actually worked on um, a team that was focused on, on uh, mobile broadband with the latitude. So the, the business notebook class of products there. And it was at the time it was 3G and um, the, the challenge in getting activations was just, you know, the, the out of box experience, the UBI, as we call it as product managers. And th there's still friction there as well. And so, and I, and I certainly see the opportunity with AI in driving uh, connected 5G, you know, PC adoption, but, um, you know, the, the, the manufacturers that, you know, the Microsofts and the Dells yes. and the HPs are going to have to work with uh, the carriers to do something to address the friction that goes along with, with, you know, initial activation. It could be a simple, you know, and again, I'm getting out of my swim lane because you're, you're a client expert, but it could be as simple as there's a, there's a 30 day free trial. And, so, you know, yeah. Right. If you remember, we talked about this last year. T-Mobile had a free 90-day trial with this, yeah, with the Surface Pro 9 5G that I'm running right here next to us. Okay. Um, it actually was kind of the pipe cleaner for for a lot of these things, where mm -hmm. you can actually go and connect with the data plan. It okay. pops open a window, and you can just pick an operator. So T-Mobile, Verizon, and a yeah. couple of these weird third-party companies. But yeah, you just <laughs> like log in, and I got I got 90 days free, and it was glorious. Um, okay. but yeah, they've really done a lot of work to make it easier. Okay, um, good. So there's now Vodafone on here and Telenor and Telia and Telstra and Swisscom and Bell and AU. So there's All a right. lot of carriers now preloaded into the Windows ecosystem um, mm -hmm. with eSIM. So I, I do think that this was kind of an anticipation of, you know, this new, new version, um, coming tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's gonna be exciting. I just you know I obviously don't want to um, break any NDAs or any any yeah. embargoes, so I'm yeah. keeping things pretty vague. But it is really something I think people should listen to and watch. Uh, it will be at 10 o'clock in the morning Pacific Standard Time. Uh, mm -hmm. I will be there in person, um, and I will be uh, live tweeting it uh, as much as I can, uh, and then I will be heading to Build to hang out with you uh, and the Dell team. Nice. Yeah. Hey, so I should stay out of your swim lane because because <laughs> I totally blew that one, man. So that that well, that's really encouraging to hear. I, you know, we've done so many podcasts now. We're we're almost approaching 200 and and you know, I'm I'm a little bit older than you are, so I'm, you know, I'm getting forgetful in my my old age, but that's super encouraging to hear that um uh, that you know, all of those mobile network operators that you mentioned, I mean, a lot of those, you know, folks that you mentioned, like Vodafone and and others, are are in Europe as well. So it's not just a U.S. thing; it's a global thing to make this happen. So, well, hey, my friend, we got this podcast in Sunday night. Hopefully, we can get it posted pretty quickly. Um, why don't you take us home? Absolutely. We hope our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting. If anyone out there would like to provide insights for a specific five G topic for a future podcast, please reach out to us on social media. Will's at Will Tontech, and I'm at Anshel Sag. We hope you have a great week and please tune in again next episode later this week and don't forget to rate and subscribe.